This is a model of the Moon's orbit in four dimensions. Notice something? Hello everyone, and today I'm going to talk about the physics of orbital mechanics in more or fewer than three dimensions. And I will kind of uh, make this the start of a possible series about uh, why it might be that our universe has three dimensions or three macroscopically visible uh, relevant spatial dimensions uh, not counting the fourth dimension that time already is and uh, any dimensions that that might exist but are essentially too small to be uh, actually noted directly in uh, macroscopic space. Now what we are looking at is a uh, modified version of my uh, old uh, orbital mechanics spreadsheet. I had uh, actually made a numerical simulation of orbital mechanics in uh, Excel because I thought it was fun and uh, Excel and similar programs may not be uh, perfectly suited for this but uh, pretty much everyone has access to something similar and uh, I've actually uh, probably I will uh, put a uh, download link to this spreadsheet in the description and what I did back then was a basic numeric simulation of uh, basic orbital mechanics and the uh, orbit of the moon around the Earth. And uh, now I've uh, modified this slightly to resemble a four-dimensional or a two-dimensional uh, space. Now the big difference is that the basic orbital mechanics we all know that you might be familiar with, that you might have noticed that the image in the beginning looked somewhat wrong because it's not really symmetric and it isn't really periodic either. Uh, these basic orbital mechanics rely on uh, gravity following the inverse square law, which isn't really an inverse square law as much as it is an inverse to the power of n minus 1 law, whereas n is the number of dimensions which of course for us means that n is 3, so n minus 1 is 2, so uh, to the power of 2 inverse square law. But in four-dimensional space it would actually be an inverse cube law, and in two-dimensional space it would be an inverse proportional law, and in one-dimensional space it would actually be a constant law, if you want to call it that way. Uh, that's simply because uh, Gravity essentially uh, spreads out uh, in gravitational waves and since these uh, do not get dampened like uh, audio waves where the air absorbs some of the energy but uh, gravitational waves just spread their uh, flow is essentially constant that uh, basically means that uh, if you take any uh, imaginary closed surface or hollow shape and uh, put it around any gravitational source, so anything that has mass, then the uh, integral of the gravitational field over that surface will always be the same only depending on the mass of the object inside and the uh, gravitational constant, not on the actual shape or size of the surface you put around it. And uh, that means that if you take any sphere with the uh, gravitational source or the object with mass in the center, then the gravitational pull at that uh, sphere surface has to be uh, inverse proportional to the actual surface area of that sphere. And since the surface area of a three-dimensional sphere is uh, proportional to the radius squared, that gives you that inverse square law. But uh, for a circle, the uh, circumference of a circle is just proportional to the radius, not uh, proportional to the radius squared. And a hypersphere's uh, surface is uh, proportional to its uh, radius cubed. Of course, there are a few other things that would uh, change with more or fewer dimensions. The uh, 
gravitational constant itself unless you express it only in uh, fundamental units but if you express it in SI units that has to be corrected as well and it would seem that the mass of objects would also change since uh, obviously a uh, four-dimensional sphere with a given radius could contain more particles than a two-dimensional circle with that same radius but uh, these are essentially proportional corrections that I've uh, taken out of this model I've just uh, changed it to behave by the uh, inverse to the power of n minus 1 law and then uh, put in the numbers to correct it so that it gives you at least in the beginning the same uh, roughly almost circular orbit that we have in the three-dimensional lunar orbit model. Now as you may have noticed in the uh, images I've shown before or now or you can see that the uh, two-dimensional model has this uh, little circulation in uh, argument of periapsis but otherwise it's uh, kind of stable but it's uh, long been theorized that a two-dimensional universe will be very simplistic and not really capable of forming the uh, complex structures we uh, know today whereas if you look at the uh, four or five dimensional simulation now also with uh, little uh, changes to the uh, orbit's original state you'll see that it's uh, very unstable you're almost always either on an escape trajectory or on a collision trajectory and the only really periodic or stable orbit is a an absolutely perfectly circular orbit whereas the three-dimensional model following the inverse square law is a, a lot more practical to handle and it uh, is a lot more stable it follows uh, Kepler's laws it's uh, always a either an escape trajectory or a periodic orbit it's always symmetric and somewhat stable and if you uh, actually don't use numerical simulation but uh, if you actually want to uh, go into the uh, principles behind that math purely mathematically and mathematically prove how these orbits behave they are uh, already a bit tricky but much easier to handle than uh, say four-dimensional orbits following the inverse cube law and yes by the way it uh, is okay to project all these orbits onto a uh, two-dimensional plane you can uh, actually project all two-body problems onto a uh, two-dimensional plane uh, that's also mathematically provable actually not just uh, independent on if it follows the inverse square law or the inverse cube law but uh, actually as long as you take any set of rules and you have a typical two-body orbital problem even if you play around with changing the physics as long as you don't have any chaotic component or any additional inputs like a third body or some kind of uh, thruster you can always project that uh, orbit to a two-dimensional orbital plane without uh, missing out on any interesting bits that can uh, also be extended uh, if you have any n-body problem and uh, speed is of course uh, relative then the input into this problem is always only two times n minus one vectors because you can set the first object or any object as a frame of reference and then you need one vector for relative position or distance to uh, the other objects and one vector for relative velocity so there are only two times n minus one vectors and so the uh, trajectory will always have to stay in a two times n minus one dimensional space or subspace that is in the case of a two-body problem a two-dimensional 
orbital plane. Now, aside from being an interesting thought experiment, this uh, can also be used as another hypothetical reasoning why the universe may have three dimensions, again uh, using the argument that uh, our universe has to be suitable for life, since uh, if you assume that there could be several universes, then it makes sense that uh, any intelligent life forms wondering uh, about why their universe has as many dimensions as it has would obviously live in a universe suitable for life, because otherwise they wouldn't be there. And other uh, thought experiments about how things might behave in more or fewer than three dimensions aside, this might deliver an explanation to why universes with more than three dimensions would not really be suitable for life, because orbital mechanics would be inherently unstable, and therefore in such universe you might get uh, stars or nebulae to form, but you would never have uh, planets forming around stars, because there would be no stable orbits that these planets could have. Actually, any object that is anywhere near where, nearby a star would, unless it is on a precisely circular orbit, be either on a collision course or on an escape trajectory, which means that any object would soon either be far away from that star or right in that star, which means that assuming that uh, a star's energy input is kind of necessary for life to be able to emerge and that the uh, inside of a star itself is not really an environment suitable for life either, that on any object you would never really have enough time for life to emerge without either drifting away from its star or falling into its star. Now this concludes our first little excourse into uh, thought experiments and uh, hypothetical physics in more than three dimensions. I am always open for requests or questions. And as always, thanks for watching.